left-wing hippie. She went on to become director of the Bush re-election campaign. Uh, about a year ago, she made her biggest mistake. She married James Carville, but she won't admit to that, <laughs> and James won't either. But at uh, any rate, uh, she, uh, he ran the Clinton campaign uh, strategy, as you know. They're an unlikely pair. They wrote a book, fascinating account, called All's Fair, Love, War, and Running for President. Great idea. And it's a, sort of a, you see it there on your screen, it's a, it's a kind of diary, if you will, of each of their ideas of what was going on at a certain time during the campaign. Mary Madeline and I are, uh, are old friends. Uh, she has been picked by Glamour Magazine as one of the women of the year. That's very impressive. Did you know I was picked by Elle Magazine? Oh, Marie Claire is one of America's six bitchiest women. Is six bitchiest women? Uh -huh. Well, they're both right. <laughs> <laughs> they're both right. You are glamorous and you can be bitchy. But, Mary, you do a wonderful job on CNBC's <laughs> Equal Time. Thanks to you, Roger. Ah, you tell you me everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I had Tom DeFrank here. He also, uh -huh. uh, part of those Newsweek guys, wrote a scam book. That the Newsweek gets all the money. None of those guys get any of the money. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. Yeah, I asked Tom if they were making any money on it. He said, no, uh, Newsweek takes all the money for that. So they have a disincentive to do a really good job, in other words. That's right. They have. <laughs> <laughs> that's why Tom holed up in a hotel and just made it up. All right, exactly. Oh, the um, Bush campaign. He had his ideas of, of, of why Bush lost. In a nutshell, why does James, do you and James agree why Bush lost? Generally, we don't spend a lot of time talking about politics, but, you know, we can take a step back and look at this. We both agree that the, uh, I'm a little bit more specific about this. He will say that generally it was over before it started. You know we started with the 41% reelect. I'm very specific in pointing to the 1990 budget deal, which was political suicide, which never would have happened if Lee Atwater was well, and you were more involved in the process. It was. I know. I did tell him not to vote for that thing, but uh, Darman and some other guys said I was insane. In fact, that was the words that they said. I said, you know, you guys cannot fall into this trap and, and vote for this tax increase. I'd say, I would, before I'd say Darman, I'd say John Sununu. Who, well, Sununu also got rolled, but he got rolled by Darman. Uh, it was Sununu who put the, in the middle of the night, tacked the press release up to the bulletin board in the basement of the White House. He's the chief of staff. Well, that is true, and he got fired. So <laughs> is this true? <laughs> so I mean, he paid. Anyway, you, I think that's the origin of the beginning of the end. It wasn't a, um, a, a an economic issue so much as a credibility issue. I advised him to shut the government down. Good one. Good which advice. I said, uh, which actually is not a bad idea. You know, every time, if Congress uh, would leave town, uh, things seem to. Quiet down. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, everything's nicer in America. Oh, I live there. I, I notice there. it. You never go there. You hate it. I, it is true. <laughs> in all the years I worked in that business, I never lived there. That's right. I did have an apartment there uh, because if I got trapped at, uh, at the airport at night, I'd have a place to stay over. But I never, I never liked that town. You know, you're prescient because I know you know this Lamar Alexander, who's going to be one of those dark horse candidates, is running exactly on that. Cut their pay and send them home. He's running on a century, a decades old theory of they should be there. The, the less amount of time they're there, the less amount of time they Well, the theory there. is that Washington really, the country really went to hell, uh, and the guy responsible for it is the guy who invented air, air conditioning. Air conditioning. Because right. when those buildings were hot, they originally picked Washington as a site for government because it was a swamp, mosquito-infested, terrible place that nobody ever wanted to go to. So they go down there for a couple months, do a little work, and couldn't wait to get out of town. Then this moron invented uh, air conditioning, and the guys enjoyed staying around and passing laws, and that's when it, everything that's went, it. Off the, that's right we went down, off the rails. That's down the toilet. Were you ever a hairdresser? Is that a true story? Is this not evidence? Yeah, of my I was going to ask prowess? about it. It is, is it spectacular. I didn't know if we'd provided that great hairdo or you I, did. My own hair. This is a hair by Madeline. Yes, I liked it, and I often consider going back to that trade. <laughs> on those hard nights at you CNBC. still have a contract with CNBC. You cannot go back to it. You can do hairdressing on the show. Would you like me to do your hair? I would like you I to do my do hair. I'd like anybody like to do my hair. <laughs> Actually, I like it. I like this you? little... You know what it is? I, it, give me a close-up here. Let me tell you what the truth is. You know these guys who get, like, grow it and then flop, yes. uh, uh, like, take it over here? I used to hate those guys. <laughs> I, and, and buying a rug and having it fall in the cheese dip at a party is not a good <laughs> idea either. And I finally said, the hell with it. You know, this is it. And so I just said, that's it. Push but it back. We, what do we know about bald men? God, we know, I'll God tell made their hormones go somewhere else. That is exactly right. How did you know that? Because I'm married to one. That's true. James, that, James and I have that in common. It is true that bald men have an excess of male hormones. When they give women male hormones when they go to the hospital, their hair falls out. That's right. And so men who are bald have an excess of male hormones. Right. So it's not their fault. 
that they're horny. It's to their credit. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, when did Get you control of this when interview. did you know you were going to marry James? Uh, I know it was long before the election. Uh, no, I didn't really. I wasn't angry with him during the election. You were angry. I started out okay. You remember this? Yeah, I do Towards the end of the okay. election, I was really it uh, personalized all of our problems and. The individual of James Carville. I think I disliked him more than I disliked Clinton, if that's possible. Did you sort this out with him after the? I mean, did you guys argue it out and get it out of your systems, or is there any harbor? Are you still holding any grudge? Roger, you've had enough fights with me. You know, I just <laughs> pout. I just pouted you for do, six you, months. You no, you don't always pout. You sometimes cry. It's you pout and <laughs> I, then you cry. Oh, first I scream. No, you swear. Yes. You swear, then you scream, then you pout, then you cry. All right. And then you show up and you're pretty funny. <laughs> it kind of went like that, except That's for the cycle. funny part. We never got <laughs> funny until Clinton's numbers started going down. I use public polls as a marital aid. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. The, uh, is he going to get reelected? The only way, can, there's two ways you know he can get reelected if it, some third party spoiler gets in. Or we don't field a good candidate. But if you look at our field now, I can't see any one of these guys beats him. Give me the four people who are going to end up in the finals for the Republicans in your judgment. Dole, Graham, Wilson. Lamar. Or Cheney. Mm -hmm. I put Cheney. Okay, so five. Yeah. Those are the five. Unless Baker runs. You'd have to put him in there. Yeah, but Baker and Cheney won't off. I mean, one of them will run, but. Probably. I can't see them going against each other. Can you? They got the same money pool. Maybe. I know. We're, we're, we know there's a lot of conventional wisdom that we can't really apply to this cycle because it's such a it's a cycle like you and I have never seen. Sixty percent of the delegates will be chosen by March, and they'll be chosen from states like New York, New Jersey, California that never played early. So that'll bring out a different kind of primary voter, I think. A guy who's uh, passed away and a good friend of both of ours, Lee Atwater, yeah. who we worked with in '88. Uh, what would he have done differently in 92 to win? He would have started in 1990. Remember when George Mitchell said the rich got richer and the poor got poorer? As you know, it wasn't true. Every piece of statistical data points to exactly the opposite. Everybody got... But the media fell better. right in behind that right. because they well, pushed that point we, Well, you know what you and Lee both did? And you'd still do if you were doing politics. You never let the media control the agenda. We controlled the agenda in 1988. And he was sick. He got sick at about the time Mitchell started that little mantra, and we never, we never recovered from that. To the extent that it was so bad that it's only been recently, thanks to Rush Limbaugh mostly, that the legacy of the Reagan years and the 80s has been the, the negative legacy that the Democrats created has been beat back. I don't think he ever would have let that happen. It's much harder to fix something after it's broken. He wouldn't have let it break in the first place. And it wasn't just him. You were not playing. I mean, you two. I really took myself out. I decided I never wanted to do politics again. Isn't that funny? I mean, after the 88 campaign and after the budget deal, right. I said, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. It and took I two never... of you guys. It took both of you guys together to double team what the media. Is, <laughs> right, exactly. And that's what is camp what are campaigns other than making the media try to report your message, which we have a much harder time of than the than the Democrats do. Are you saying that most of the Washington press corps are Democrats? Yes. Well, not only that. They're liberal scum Democrats. <laughs> Look what they've done to Newt Gingrich, okay? Yeah, you they've were... demonized Gingrich. I mean, we don't know whether Gingrich is going to be good or bad, but it doesn't matter. They've already decided he's off. How could he be bad? I mean, is is an entire country wrong to have produced the the most monumental election cycle in 62 years? The whole country's wrong, and the Washington press corps is right. Did you read that Howie Kurtz piece in yeah, the Post? One hundred percent of the coverage of Newt Gingrich from Labor Day on has been negative. Only 69 percent is negative on Clinton. That, to me, is remarkable. That just about says it all. It just, this is the maddest I've ever been. Madder than when they attacked President Bush in, in either campaign. This is the ultimate. This is the worst. They have really showed their colors this time. The press has just decided to try to destroy Newt Gingrich, is what you're saying. And they don't, and I'll tell you what else they're doing. They are reprioritizing our agenda for us. These guys say, yeah, we might get to school and prayer, voluntary moment of reflection in July. We want to focus on the balanced budget amendment. Our first vote is going to be on 
changing the way Congress does business. Our second vote in January is going to be on the balanced budget minute, line item veto, all these tax issues, restructuring the tax code. Maybe in the summer we'll get to these cultural issues. What is the press leading with? And they're making us sound like a bunch of extra chromosomes, as Al Gore called us. Oh, yes, he did. Uh, we're talking with Mary Madeline, very mild, laid-back woman who has no strong opinions. And we'll be back right after this to find out how much heat she's taken as a woman having these conservative views. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen your husband embarrassed. I didn't he think he could so be embarrassed. embarrassed. You he know was you humiliated. You pay me to do that. I pay you, you to pay do that. You pay me to do That's that. That's on CNBC. Not very often, fortunately, but it is on CNBC. That was Don <laughs> Imus looking shocked. That was Don Imus with Tony Kornheiser, um, who was really angry with me because I remembered to bring down my round hairbrush to use as my <laughs> faux microphone, and he didn't have one. So uh, that's what he was embarrassed about, of anything else you, you could have. You know Imus well, and I've been on his show many times. I'm not allowed to go on anymore because I lost my freedom of speech. The White House demanded I be fired when the last time I was on I said something funny and uh, oh, they, they were no the badge of honor they demanded I be fired in the campaign they weren't the white I house I know but then. I can't do it because I now working for NBC they they are using that too as a club. bad because I miss those insults for Andrew you I, regularly <laughs> hit us when you I were used on to there. Say, that's right I used to go on and, and savage uh, you a little All bit right. no, I, I knew you would understand is Imus alive? I mean, he's actually real and alive, right? I saw him sitting there. He looks dead. Now, if he's watching, Imus, I want you on this program, but you're gutless. You, you want me on your program, but you won't come on this program. He won't come on here. Uh, well, he doesn't need to. Well, he does need to. He does. I'm going to sit here and savage him every night like he does to people. Oh, he, no. if you read his new book. Actually, no, but I understand it's very funny. Imus it's hilarious. is a very, very funny man, as you know. Talented. Talented guy. Smart. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what else he is? He's he's making my point that we were talking about in the commercial break, um, that candidates have uh, have new outlets, have alternative forms of media to communicate with the voter, which cuts through the mainstream media, which filters and distorts and and analyzes what the candidate says, as opposed to just telling what the candidate says. That's what they do on IMAS. I mean, thank God we have Rush, we don't, you know, who was the only voice of a conservative governing approach in the dark days of our defeat, the fetal position days, as I call them. But guys like this who understand politics and have um, provide a forum for candidates are going to be successful. How much heat do you get being a woman and not being a sort of, uh, you know, to be in the public eye today is tough to be conservative. Right. Because they paint you immediately as not caring about people, being a hater, we're not worrying about the ozone. Ozone hole. You heard what happened yesterday, didn't you? Mary Tyler Moore offered a thousand for that old lobster out there that wants to live, <laughs> so nobody would eat it in the restaurant. And Rush Limbaugh called and offered two thousand dollars so he could eat it. Uh, and that, that, of course, is one of the funniest ideas in the world. But but they say, ah, you see, that conservative, he's a heartless guy. Now, as a woman, you have an added problem because if you don't wear all the ribbons and come out for all the right causes and act like all the right things, right. they think you're really heartless. Do you right. have that problem? Oh, yeah. People, um, somebody uh, on Phil Donahue's show, as a matter of fact, and their CNBC hero, said, I never thought you were a human being till I read the book. You know, people say that kind of stuff all the time. I think these people that call us racist bigots and homophobes are racist bigots, homophobes, and misogynists. The kinds of policies they want to perpetuate have kept entire communities for generations, interge intergenerationally dependent, degraded, and in poverty. So I think they're racist. I know I'm not a racist. I was raised in a community where I was regularly made fun of a minority. I'm a Croatian. I'm, you know, I don't expect any big sympathy for that. I never thought of myself as a victim. And all of these, these programs that are not only don't work, but have created uh, cultures that think they're victims don't work. So, the, you know, sticks and stones can break my bones. But real people out there, um, you know, are you to get a chance to travel around anymore? Yeah, not too much. I tried to. One of the reasons I got out was because I didn't want to go on the road anymore. But I still go to some places. So I go to Ohio and see some family okay. in Texas. Aren't they kind of normal California. in Ohio? Yeah, they are normal in Ohio, actually. And they can't understand how I 
ended up on the East Coast or living in New York. But I keep a bag packed in New York. You never know. I may leave at any moment. This is true. Yeah. Lots of flights. Actually, one of the reasons I took this job in Fort Lee, New Jersey, is that there are, like, real people here. You go across the street to yes. the diner, you see real people. It's not Manhattan. Yeah. Oh, those you know, are not you can, real people. You can go out for a sandwich and not be mugged. It's nice. Oh, that's, and that's always an advantage. Yeah. Freedom you were a mud. Croatian in what kind of a neighborhood? Did people know what a Croatian was at that time? Well, there were Italians and Germans and Poles and Serbians. Every Saturday we used to have a rumble with the Serbs. Really? Which then I had, you know, we'd have a lamb roast, then we'd have a rumble. I said, why <laughs> do we do this every week? You know, I had no idea who are these people. My we dad did softball. Said, it's just the way it is. Well, we what are you? What's your... I have no real idea. I think my relatives, my ancestors fooled around a lot. Actually, <laughs> I'm told my grandmother thinks I was, we are descended from Stonewall Jackson. The Civil War. It's true. My grandmother's name was Jackson. Came from the same place, Stonewall. They were all kind of mm. so. There's some something about that, and English and uh, French and uh, some other things. So you're kind of a Heinz. 57. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I was Heinz 57. There's something pit bullish about you. Is that it? Yes. What do you mean pit bullish? Well, that's can... the, the people think pit bulls kill. In a good way. <laughs> <laughs> Tenacity is what I was thinking of. Not. Murder. That is true. You don't. You want to do something, you do it. I mean, you get a you get a grip on it. And you don't let go till it's done. That is true. But you have that same quality. In fact, they said that Mary Madeline was the Roger Ailes of the '92 campaign. <laughs> you know? Yes, they did say that. I actually sent you some wine after you came out with something in the White House. Everybody was whimpering in the Bush campaign and trying to make you apologize for something you said. What was that? Oh, you didn't send me wine. You sent me a huge basket full of food. It was the only oh, food I? I ate for a week. It had cheese. It had candy. It had crackers. Well, it I had sent fruit. You because I thought you were the only one in the Bush campaign that had any guts and would say what really everybody was thinking. You know, that wasn't it. I just, you know, what I was trying to do through these attack faxes for which the New York Times called me sophomoric and Michael Kinsley's called me moronic was to get break through the press. And I had to do it in a way that caused some consternation. <laughs> well, you're very quotable. We have another uh, segment coming. This is the book, All's Fair. Forget this guy. This is Mary Madeline. She's with us and she'll be right back. This guy. We can show That was sweet little Mary Madeline, <laughs> long before she learned to swear and drink beer and wave her arms and act crazy in front of crowds. <laughs> you were the homecoming queen of what high school? Thornton Fractional North. Uh, the cute, there were six women in the race, six girls, and uh, I got, I don't know how I got nominated, but the five cute girls split the cute girl vote, and I just ran up the middle. It was my first political lesson. It wasn't a big Croatian turnout or anything, was it? It so was, just it was uh, my sister owned the freshman class, and I was going out with a senior. It honestly was my first political thing. You always split hung out with vote. older guys, looks like, right? Well, even at a 10 to 15 year age difference, they're still not quite mature. You know <laughs> what I mean? You ought to know. I know. <laughs> Now they're going to wonder about that, Mary. Uh, Let them wonder. Yeah. Tell me about Ross Perot. Give me a description of Ross Perot's personality in your mind. He is a supercilious, self-interested, megalomaniacal, worthless waste of skin. <laughs> okay. Uh, and as, as is evidenced by, he had one... What do you have? One victorious candidate? Ross, I didn't know she was going to say that, by the way. I'll be honest with you. I mean, <laughs> He's the only I'm guy. not a big fan of yours either, but I didn't know she was going to say that. Let, look at this. He has had, he, he only went to where he could get press. That's why I say self-interested and, and a megalomaniac. He hurt Ann Richards in Texas. His endorsement hurt Ann Richards in Texas. Bob Squire denies that, but I had Squire on election night, and I thought he drove Ann Richards' vote down. He did, and I had dinner with Don Sipple, who was Wilson's, uh, when G uh, Governor Wilson was on our show last week, and he also did Junior, and he said it, he, it was a blip up, and then it drove him back, drove her back. So so what? He, he's a phony. Look, he he's he a endorsed Colasano here in New York, <laughs> and he immediately dropped, he went from eight points to four after the... Here's what he is. Let me finish this thought, because it's important for people, because I, in no me way, mean to... Um, attack people who followed him. They really thought he was re representing a new way of looking at government, but he's a hypocrite and he's a phony. He talks, he attacks government, he attacks lobbyists, and as you know, all of his billions of dollars were made off of government contracts, and he lobbied the hell out of Congress. He's a hypocrite. <laughs> 
How do you feel? Has Bill Clinton learned anything since he's been in the presidency? Is he doing a better job today than he was before? And and is he doing a good enough job to get himself reelected? You know, they, these guys in Washington inside the Beltway are always dancing on the head of the pin. They keep saying, well, Leon Panetta, the new chief of staff, is doing better. But we can't see it. You know, people in Ohio can't see that Leon's doing better. He's not letting the kids go on the talk shows. What difference does that make? Well, he's not letting Hillary out of the cage. I mean, the, I don't the, think he's not letting. I think she kind of figured out that, that the, she got a massive rejection on well, health care. Look at this poll that um, the president's pollster just did for the Democratic Leadership Convention, which which uh, conference, which Bill Clinton used to head up, the moderate Democrat um, organization. He had says specifically that he lost the majority of independents, which account for 30 percent of the electorate now, because of the health care proposal. That was that was a real silver bullet or a negative silver bullet for them. Is he getting better? I think he's a consummate politician. We never said, we never denied his political prowess in 92 and won't again in 96, but I don't know what he's learning because look at what these guys tried to say coming out of this historic election. They just didn't know what we did, you know? They didn't yeah. know our accomplishments. If they knew his accomplishments or what he did, he would have lost by more in this past election. <laughs> why, are not, why are more women not conservative? I don't think that's true. I think that's another press misnomer because... In other words, there are a lot of ones that are hidden and don't speak oh, out like you? Oh, my goodness, yes. Um, the, as this election cycle showed, all the women who swept in were swept in in the year of the woman, 1992, lived by the gender, by, died by the gender, as I said in 1992, never parlay your gender, that's stupid. Most of those women were swept out, and guess equal numbers or more numbers of women, conservative women were swept in. I think we picked up five congressional seats and one Senate seat. Ronald Reagan in his re-election campaign, as I recall, won the woman's vote. Sure, we had. We're winning the. You know, everyone's talking about the angry white men, which we're still we're getting. By the way, that's not necessarily wrong nor bad. It's not wrong nor <laughs> bad, but it's not. We're not angry. Twenty-one percent of the people identified themselves as angry. This was an affirmative, positive vote. People were voting for something, which is less government. And women were voting that way. You know, who we did well with is suburban married women. That's who we lost in '92 off of that horrible convention. Is Newt making a mistake to bring up prayer in school instead of sticking to economic I think issues? Newt is only, Newt's only mistake is thinking he's going to get an even break from the press. He wasn't leading with prayer in school. He's assigned uh, a congressman to look at it for a potential vote in July. He's focusing on the balanced budget amendment, term limits, line item veto, economic issues, and he, the, he just utters something like, uh, social issue and the press plays it up. He's he's making a mistake to think he's going to get an even break from the press. Having said that, who could be against voluntary prayer in school? I mean, let I hope we. Phil can... Donahue is. He and I had a big debate about it. Uh, good. Well, let him run. Let those guys say that they're against God. Let the Democrats run against God. I like that. Yeah. My my issue is not whether. I mean, as you know, I I believe that that uh, uh, there should be separation of church and state in the sense that there should be no mandated religion. But I always thought, you know, I don't honestly care what the kid in the seat next to me does. That doesn't affect my child. It doesn't affect me as far as I'm concerned. This idea that I'm going to somehow terrorize this child because right. I feel like praying or he's going to terrorize me because I feel like praying. I don't care what he does. You can read a funny book if he wants. Right. It's not my problem. And that's what the language of the amendment says that there can be no um, dictation of what the, the moment of silence and is And I agree with for. that. I don't think you should dictate anything, but in a, in a place where guys are carrying 357 magnums into the classroom, that's more terrifying to me exactly. than whether the guy wants to do something but over don't there. I know you're not, but we can't fall in this trap to letting the media say that we're leading with this issue. We are not leading with this issue, but the Republican Party does represent a different set of values than the Democratic Party does. Do you I don't think, think we should shy away from it is what I'm saying, but we're not leading with it. What is going to keep the Republicans from currying favor with the media and trying to suck up to them so that they end up in the same position as the Democrats? Many Republicans get elected and then try to suck up and lose it. What's going to preclude their sucking up to them is that it's not going to do any good. There's only so many hours of the day, and if you spend time sucking up to them with no advantage, then, you know, we work under market forces. We will go to what <laughs> serves us, and it ain't going to be the media, the mainstream media, at least. So you think there are a lot more conservative women in America than the media paints? Oh, man, I know that, because I travel around the country, because I don't make enough money at CNBC. I had to go get speeches. <laughs> I knew she was going to sneak that in, folks. I knew she was going to take a shot about her contract. I negotiated a new contract for her. Jane Wallace, 
left, you know. She's over she's there at FX great. terrorizing those people. She's doing great. Oh, she's over there. She's terrorizing them. She'll be back. Anyway, uh, in the meantime, we'll find a new uh, co-host for you soon. We have to wrap it up. Mary Madeline, my good friend, thanks Thank for coming. Thank you, Roger. Okay, good to see you.